given the field k, let's consider those cubic polynomials over k. So uh, writing it as a functor is really just a way to organize that, right? For each field, we consider those cubics over those fields. And similarly, uh, we might also want to consider other classes of objects uh, in differential algebra, like differential modules over a given field k. And uh, if you have a differential module over k and you want it uh, to say to somehow define it over a bigger field, then you can extend by scalars or tensor to that larger field. Excuse me, I, I, I missed something. Could you say again what the assumptions on, on f, c, and k are? Right, so I just assume like the classical uh, setting where, um, uh, right, f is just a fixed differential field that, um, that any other extension will lie over. And c will be algebraically closed and characteristic zero. So um, I guess the reason for this is just so that I can comfortably know that like most facts hold uh, from picard visio theory and not have to worry about like individual assumptions. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, we are interested also in, in addition to differential modules, um, in picard visio extensions uh, with a given differential Galois group G. Recall that Galois extensions right, can be viewed as G torsors, where G is a finite group. And similarly, picard visio extensions are uh, G torsors, but now uh, G is a linear algebraic group. Um, because the isomorphism here uh, is actually a differential isomorphism, meaning it respects the derivation on the rings, uh, we will say that this is a differential torsor. Uh, and we want to study the, the collection of all these differential torsors uh, over um, the fields. So we are gonna denote the, this functor by G torse with a del, uh, where I just use del as a shorthand for the word differential. And if you don't like the geometric language that much, then you can just think of these as uh, more or less just uh, PV extensions. So we want to just study PV extensions, um, but we use the more geometric language of a uh, differential torsor. And you mean, sorry, you mean PV up to isomorphism over K? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, as, dif right. as differential fields? Yes, right. Uh, sorry for right. interruptions, I'm just trying to understand. No, yeah, okay. this is, sorry. yeah, this is perfect. You're keeping me right on um, to make sure that everything's working. Um, right, so um, we're interested in things up to not just an isomorphism, but differential isomorphisms. Okay, so now let's try to formalize what, it, what we mean by counting parameters. So if we look back at the example of cubic polynomials, if you just have any cubic uh, with coefficients in a field k, then uh, we really don't need to mention the entire field k because all its coefficients already lie in the field generated, the differential field generated by the coefficients a, b, and c. So uh, the, right, the polynomial really lies, have coefficients in this subfield. And if you consider this polynomial up to simplifying, it's equivalent to a polynomial in two parameters, D and E, where D and E now are in terms of A, B, and C. So really this new polynomial now is defined over an even smaller subfield uh, generated by D and E. And we can further right, simplify it down to another polynomial so then our cubic really simplifies down to a polynomial with one parameter. And so it, uh, its coefficients lie in a field uh, generated by G, one parameter G. So in general, if we have any class of objects, so given by functor F, then an object A over a field K, we say that it descends to K naught if there is an object of that class, uh, A naught over K naught, such that A naught over K will give back A. And uh, the differential essential dimension of an object A, we're going to define it to be the minimum of the transcendence degree, uh, differential transcendence degrees 
of the um, field, differential fields that A is defined, uh, that it descends to. So in other words, we measure how complicated an object A is by how small of a differential field it can descend to. Sorry, again, I, I'm really sorry. Just, can you go back to the previous slide? Yes. Yeah. What, is, what is this arrow K0 to K? Uh -huh, sorry. Uh, so K0 to K is the inclusion of subfield. Uh, so F is a functor. So we have to define it on morphisms. And on, the morphism here is K0 includes inside K. And the functor to sets is just the, is what? Sorry, what is that again? The functor F is what exactly? Uh, so I'm just saying let F be a functor. So it for depends, example- It depends on the functor, you mean? Uh, yes. Oh, so, okay, the whole thing right. depends on the choice of functor. Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you, sorry. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, for example, right, we uh, one choice of functor that we uh, kind of like class of objects that we formalize the functors was uh, cubic polynomials up to simplifying. Uh, another class we had was differential modules. Uh, and on the morphisms, we define on the morphisms uh, what it means for uh, F uh, to take a morphism uh, K naught includes into K by sending a differential module over K naught to tensoring it over K. Okay, right. So the differential essential dimension of an object is just the minimum of the differential transcendence degree of uh, the fields that it uh, descends to. And uh, the differential essential dimension of the functor, which we think of as like the class of objects, is just the maximum of the differential essential dimensions of all its objects over all its fields k. Um, so, sorry, I have a typo here. So it should say over all k over f and all a in uh, the functor f of k. Um, why, so, why, is there, me, why is there a parenthesis over k? Uh, sorry, uh, that's a typo on my part. Uh, it should say A is an uh, inside F of K. Right, okay. Oh, F of K. Yeah. K, but, but K is an extension of F already, right? Sorry, uh, the functor uh, curly math cow F of K. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm lost a little bit. Uh, all right, uh, maybe let me try to give an explicit um, example of this. Maybe that might help. Um, so in the example of cubic polynomials up to linear changes of variables, if we start with a cubic polynomial defined over the field K, then we saw that it really uh, is defined over the, it descends to a subfield F adjoined G in one parameter. So we say that the differential essential dimension of that cubic is, uh, we define its differential essential dimension was uh, the smallest uh, differential transcendence degree uh, of the differential fields that it descends to. So here, since it descends to F uh, adjoined G, it has, um, in its differential essential dimension must be at most uh, that differential uh, transcendence degree, which is one or one or less. Uh, if G is inside F, for example, then the differential transcendence degree here would be zero. If G is differentially transcendental over F, then the differential transcendence degree here will be one. Uh, the differential is central, yeah. You do allow the, uh, the, the minimal field I mean, our parameters could be more than one parameter, right? Uh, yes. Okay. So in other words, if the differential transcendence degree could be two, three, or any number, right? Right. Okay. So is the is the field generated by such a set of parameters a field of definition for the yes for the geometry object? Right. So yeah, uh, another right right. So uh, the word descends to uh, you can say also right differential field of definition. Okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the differential essential dimension of just 
an individual object. It's just the differential transcendence degree of its differential field of uh, definition. Okay, great. Uh, so can I ask one more thing? So you, yeah. So it's like you've got a bunch of objects and you've yes. got some notion of equivalence. Yes. And it's like, and, and there's a moduli space up to right. equivalence and it's the, it's the dimension of the sort of moduli. Right, if the moduli space exists. Um, well, it's something like that anyway. Right, we'll yeah, so, so that's like the kind of like the abstract point of view is that you're trying to measure kind of like an approximate, approximate notion of the moduli space, but then the moduli space might not exist. Um, so then, right, you kind of like, um, right. Um, yeah, so then um, back to this example, um, for an individual object, the differential essential dimension is, uh, could be zero or one. But then if you look at how complicated the general objects could be, um, if you let A, B, and C be indeterminate, then you can make this differential transcendence degree one. So okay. then the cubic polynomials, the entire class, it's the maximum complexity of any uh, cubic up to linear changes of variable is one. Uh, so, so we have a question in the chat. Um, okay. Asking, uh, I think you might have um, talked about that just now, but how does the cubic, cubic example fit into the formal setup? Uh-huh, right. So that's a good question. So in the formal setup, uh, the cubic polynomial, uh, the cubic polynomials define a functor, uh, f of, so maybe I should use uh, one note or something so that I can write. Right, so the formal setup is in terms of functors. Um, and we, we define the functor F from, I guess, differential fields uh, to set, in this case, by sending a field K to the class of uh, cubic polynomials over K. Uh, uh, this is up to linear changes of variables. And then uh, since this is a functor, we have to say what it does to morphisms. So if we have uh, uh, inclusion of subfutes, oh. then right, we just view that, uh, right, uh, all right, so the set of cubics over K uh, up to isomorphism we send it yeah. to the set of cubics well, yeah. over L just by inclusion, right? So F is in K adjoined X, right? So then F is in L adjoined X. Um, is this okay? Uh, and then uh, in the case of say, X cubed plus A X squared plus B X plus C, uh, say this is in k join x, then this is right the class of this up to changes variables. Uh, this is an f join k. But then, right, since we're working up to the equivalence of linear changes of variables, you can always change it to another choice of variable. Uh, what was it? Uh, D x plus e. Uh, right, so, yeah, and we can also further write it as like x cubed plus gx plus g, where, right, the g's are in terms of d's and e's, and the d's and e's are in terms of a, b, and c. And uh, so this is, uh, so for example, right, under uh, the inclusion of uh, a joint d and e is inside k, we have the functor, right, evaluated at that field. It takes this just like the, x, the class of x cubed plus dx plus e. This is a cubic with coefficients in f adjoint d and e. All right, I guess you just includes in here. And then, right, this is the same over k. This is equivalent to 
that original qubit. Is this so, okay? So your equivalent class bracket should have a subscript for the field, right? Uh, yes, right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, is the formalization part okay? Is it, suppose I have two fields, K and L, and they are, let's say, both transcendental with one degree. Uh, okay. Would that, would that give the same image under your functor? Uh, I mean, I'll, oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, because of the fields. Okay, sorry. Uh -huh. That's all right now. All right. Um, Right, so well, I guess one similar remark is that in general, um, oh, sorry, I stopped sharing. Uh, one general remark is that uh, a, a minimum uh, field of definition might not exist, but right, you can always take the minimum of the transcendence degree or the differential transcendence degree. <laughs> okay, so this is the formalism, but um, I guess we don't really have to worry about the formalism we're just going to work here in this talk with like just thinking of everything as parameter counting and that should get us through most of it. So my justifications are just going to be, uh, here's how it probably is going to work intuitively. In the, in the differential case, yes. are the equivalent classes uh, defined uh, the transformations? Must they be still differentially linear or could they be differentially polynomial? Uh, uh -huh. So, in this specific case, I'm just looking at these as algebraic objects. Right. Um, so there's no differential things going on. But um, I guess one could also look at like maybe some other kinds of things where there's differential things going on. And for you know, me- Thinking about difference, you start with a differential polynomial. Uh -huh. Like uh, Picabase extension. Uh, so maybe for Picabase extension, you would just have linear Right, yeah, right. But, uh, but for other kinds of differential polynomials, you may allow other equivalences. Right, that's absolutely right. So for me, since I'm working within uh, the Picard-Visio theory, I'm just gonna stick to like the types of things that occur there. Okay. Right, uh, makes my life easier and that's like, I think, uh, right. Um, okay, so let's first look, um, so now that we had like our first example, let's look at another example for, uh, differential uh, torsors uh, with group GM to the N, well, I want to claim that you need at least N parameters to describe them. And the reason really is that we understand these well. Um, so if we want to write down something that probably requires at least N parameters, then we probably should use indeterminates A1 through AN. And uh, remember that the GM N torsor, differential torsors, we said, if we don't want to think about torsors, we think about PV extensions. Sorry. Do you mean, again, this, this notation was about a, a given object, the ED delta F about a given object. Now you've got a family of objects. Yes. What are you talking about? So the, the ED of the family of objects is the maximum ED of the, each individual object. Did you write that? that did you say that before? Uh, yes. For the functor F here. Oh, um, Max, sorry, sorry, I, I, yeah. didn't, I missed it. There's a lot of, yeah, it's a lot of information coming through that one's, one's missing, you know. Sorry, yeah, there, this is like, uh, yeah, definitely like a lot of things. The formalism is like, right, like hard at first, but then the examples are like what's making it kind okay, of like- Okay, so, thank you. Yeah, so right, um, let's work with more about the like examples. Um, so, um, just a quick, would you uh, want to leave the proof for the, after the, um, uh, breakout room sessions where you can okay. go through it and we gotcha. Thanks. That yeah, that sounds good. Thank so you. maybe I should just roughly say what the intuition for each thing should be. Uh, the idea is that right, GM to the n ex, uh, extensions, uh, PV extensions, are understood well, just like GA type extensions are understood well, just like how in Galois theory, um, Coomer extensions and R and Schreier extensions are understood well. So then you can explicitly write down that they need n parameters. Okay. Uh, okay, and similarly, 
there are maybe some extensions that we don't understand as well, but then we still get some bounds. For example, if you look at GLN extensions, they really are given by uh, differential equations of order n, so you need n parameters there. And if you have SLN extensions, they're given by differential equations uh, where what, you can... Why is it so clear that even if your linear differential equation has n parameters, that it can be simplified to fewer? It's just like the polynomial case. Uh, sorry, in the SLN example? Oh, okay. Uh, so, so, sorry, in the GLN okay. example. I mean, you claim that because you're in a pickup as extension given by a linear differential polynomial, and then you have n coefficients. Right. Then that is then say that this is n, uh, the essential uh, degree. Uh, right, yeah. Right? But uh, in the algebra case, you have you start with an equation of three, but then you are able to shrink it down to one. Uh -huh. so why, how do you know that you can shrink this uh, differential equation linear differential into fewer parameters? Uh -huh. That is exactly my goal for this talk. Right. Thanks for, yeah. This is like a great advertisement for why we should <laughs> venture forward. <laughs> um, but before that, I would just want okay. to say- So the, the next line, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Sorry, so I guess uh, not, uh, maybe we're not close to it yet, but then okay. eventually that will be our goal. The idea, right, so similarly for SLN kind of like um, uh, extensions, uh, you, can, uh, you can always find a differential equation where like the A1 coefficient is zero. Yeah, right, yeah. Okay. So that needs one less parameter. Okay, so now our goal <laughs> that we just talked about is that we want to say that, um, I guess, right, on the surface, it's not so clear that this is the same thing. Right. But we'll see why this is going to be similar. And that is that we can't simplify general differential equation by gauge transformations uh, over the uh, field uh, F adjoin A1 through AN if A1 through AN are uh, indeterminates. So just one more thing, sorry. So, so the point here is that uh, these A1 to AN are like generic differential transcendentals over Yes, X. absolutely, okay. right, so. And you cannot do gauge transformations to, to, over K to, yeah. right. to, reduce, to reduce it, right? Right. Something else, so it starts off with dimension N, right. yeah, and you can't, okay. Right, That's so right. Yeah. yeah, the formal, the formal uh, realization is that the differential essential dimension of this general object uh, should be n. Um, when you, I mean, just to clarify, when you say a one a n are indeterminate, yeah. you actually mean that they're just differential, or they're just they're differential, uh, differential they're, transcendental, or transcendental. They're differential indeterminate. So a one uh, uh, and all its derivatives, they're all indeterminate. Okay. And, uh, you, but uh, there's still a difference between in the differential indeterminates and the family being differential transcendental over a particular field. Okay. Fact, that's, what he, that's what he means, William. He means precisely that A1 to AN are differential transcendental over F. That's what he means. He says indeterminates. Yeah, I mean, over F, right? You, when you say exactly you over F. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Um, right. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, the first goal. And the second goal is that a generic PV extension uh, is, um, this is studied by Juan, Lade, and Maggot. Uh, I won't, uh, I guess due to time, I would just say that a generic PV extension is kind of like a very general PV extension that can specialize to any other PV extension with the same Galois group. Um, these have been studied and constructed, um, but my goal here is to say that if you were to write down a generic PV extension, then you can't be greedy and use too few parameters. You have to at least use, right, like a certain number of parameters. Okay, so the common theme in our goal is that both involve, first involves a different, a general kind of differential equation. The second one involves like a generic uh, PV extension. So both are general or generic in the sense that they can specialize to any other uh, object in that class of objects. And so then our philosophy is that the general object should be the most complicated one in its class. And indeed, this is true. The differential essential dimension of the general differential module or the general differential equation is equal to the differential essential dimension of its entire class of differential modules. 
So the differentiary essential dimension of this one object is equal to the differentiary essential dimension of the entire class, the enti that functor. And similarly, for generic PV extensions over uh, K, the transcendence, differential transcendence degree of K should be bounded below by the differential essential dimension of the class of differential G torsors. And so our approach to study our goals one and two would be to try to understand the things on the right-hand side, to understand the differential essential dimension of their classes of objects. Um, and um, the reason or the way that we're going to bound these is with the subgroup bound. If H is a subgroup of G, then we should expect that the class of differential G torsors should be at least as complicated as the class of differential H torsors. And so if we accept that this bound is true, then we can already achieve goal two partially. Um, if you have a generic PV extension over K, then the number of parameters, right, the differential transcendence degree of K is bounded below by a number where it's N if the group is GLN and N minus one if the group is SLN. And the reason why that's true is because we've already computed the differential essential dimension for certain examples, and we have the subgroup bound. So for the group GLN, we know that we need at, least, at most n parameters, and it's bounded below by the uh, different class of differential GM to the n torsors, and that class needs uh, requires at least n parameters. So then together you get that right. The GL for GLN you need exactly n parameters. So what makes the entire theory kind of work is that to get upper bounds and lower bounds is that you have this subgroup bound kind of proposition. And you can do a similar thing with SLN also. So this is like, I guess, like the main tool that the subgroup bound is the main tool that makes things work in this theory. Um, so now that we've kind of resolved goal uh, two, let's try to do goal one. And the idea here is we need to, instead of talking about differential modules, we need to talk about twisted forms in a differential setting. Um, so if we have a object M, then another object N is said to be a twisted form of it. If over a big enough field, they become isomorphic. So isomorphic here means differentially isomorphic. Um, so as an example, we saw differential modules. Uh, as an example, any differential module over a big enough field, they become the trivial differential module. And a differential torsor over a big enough field, they become trivial as a differential torsor. And just like in Galois cohomology, the twisted forms are going to be classified by a cohomology set. So the cohomology we're going to use, uh, unlike Galois cohomology, where the groups are abstract groups, these are going to be linear algebraic groups. And instead of uh, the maps being maps of sets, the maps here are now morphisms of varieties. Uh, man, just to let you know that uh, yeah. the 30 minutes have run out. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. If you'd like, you can uh, show us your, your uh, main theorem and then okay. we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, after the breakout session. Okay, so um, in one minute, the description of the main <laughs> theorem is that the twisted, uh, the second goal or the first goal is that uh, you can re, re express differential modules as differential torsors for the group GLN. So then uh, the idea is then that the general differential module or the general differential equation, uh, how many parameters you need to write it is given by the is a differential essential dimension of the class of differential modules, which uh, is uh, using cohomology, you see that it's. Uh, it's the same as um, the differential essential dimension for the class of GLN differential torsors, which we already saw as N. So uh, I guess to sum the summary for the second goal is that, right, to measure the differential essential dimension of the general differential module, study the same thing for the class of differential modules, you re-express that um, as um, GLN differential torsors. Uh, so let me just stop there. All right, so let us clap uh, for the speaker. Uh, 
So as I mentioned, so we will now go into um, breakout rooms where we all can uh, chat for a little bit. We'll do three breakout rooms and then uh, we'll come back and uh, you'll have more time to show off some of your proofs and more details and we'll ask more questions. Uh, how do you, will you assign us to breakout rooms? Uh, Rooney, you're muted. Let's <laughs> just now. Uh, uh, I should, uh, Alex, I should, should stop the recording or sh shall I continue? Oh, we, uh, yes, please stop the recording and then uh, let's go to the breakout rooms. Okay. <laughs> 